Good evening, and welcome to tonight's event. There lives the dearest, freshest, deep down things. A reading and conversation with the British poet, Kieran Wynne, and American poet, Saskia Hamilton, moderated by our very own Christopher Ricks. My name is Vivian Schmidt, and I'm the Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration and Director of the Center for International Relations here at Boston University. Tonight's event is the eighth in a series of conversations with European artists and writers being organized by the Institute for Human Sciences at Boston University in collaboration with the Center for International Relations, my center, the in literary journal Agni, the American Literary Translators Association, and Zephyr Press. Previous speakers in the series, among others, include German author Bernard Schlink, the filmmaker Agnes Valda, Basque writer Bernardo Atzaga, and British poet Simon Armitage. Next week, at the Goethe Institute, we host a lecture by German filmmaker Ulrike Ottinger, and we look forward to conversation with the former German dissident Wolf Biermann, Swedish poet Goran Sonevi, Slovenian poet Tomasz Salamun, and the artist Krzysztof Bodisko. Yeah, that's the one I, that I never get. Um, so be sure to pick up a schedule of our upcoming events before you leave this evening. Tonight's conversation takes place as part of a series of events funded by the European Commission delegation in Washington, DC, and we're, of course, very grateful for their support for this initiative. I would also like to thank our partners, Agni editors Ven Burkertz and Bill Pierce, Meg Tyler of the Boston University Poetry Series, Chandler Rosenberger from Brandeis University, formerly from our Department of International Relations, and Elizabeth Amrian of the Institute for Human Sciences, who's the person who is largely responsible for making all of this work perfectly. So it's a great honor tonight to be able to introduce uh, our speakers. Kieran Wynne was educated at Tronbridge School, where he later briefly taught, and at Christ Church, Oxford, where he was awarded a doctorate for a thesis on Herbert Reed and T.S. Eliot. His poems have appeared in magazines including Agenda, The Dark Horse, the London Magazine, Oxford Magazine, Oxford Poetry, Poetry Review, The Rialto, and The Spectator, and in a short film about his work on BBC One. A selection of, the, of his poems appears in the Carcanet Anthology, Oxford Poets, 2007. He was awarded the University of Oxford's English Poem on a Sacred Subject Prize in 2007. He lives in Oxford, where he's a freelance teacher. Saskia Hamilton is the author of two books of poetry, As for Dream, 2001, and Divide These, 2005. She is also the editor of the Letters, Letters of Robert Lowell, 2005, and a co-editor of Words in the Air, The Complete Correspondence Between Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell, 2008. She's the recipient of a Bunting Fellowship from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She teaches at Barnard College, Columbia University, and lives in New York City. This evening's moderator, Christopher Ricks, is the William M. and Sarah B. Warm Professor of the Humanities at Boston University. He was elected Professor of Poetry at Oxford in 2004 and is known both for his critical studies and for his editorial work. Tonight's event will run approximately 90 minutes, after which I hope you'll all, you'll all join us for a reception and a book signing. And without further ado, I hand it over to Christopher Ricks. And Thank you very much. My pleasure in welcoming on our behalf our two poets is the greater in that I didn't play any part in inviting them. I don't mean that I would have uh, balked at inviting them. I like very much the fact that the choice of them as our poets is quite independent of me, uh, but confirms my sense that they are very good poets indeed. As the professor of poetry at Oxford, not a poet, I felt it right that I should have in each term three times for the five years, therefore, uh, both an Oxford poet and an American poet who would come over and read for us in Oxford. Uh, Saskia Hamilton was on one occasion the American poet, as was David Ferry, George Caligiris, who I'm delighted to see in the room this evening, and many other uh, poets who, of whom towards whom I have both friendship and admiration. Kieran Ruin was one of the Oxford poets whom I invited, so it's a particular pleasure to me to have this coinciding. I will be very brief in introducing them. We've heard the facts well related to us. 
Um, alphabetical order mattered to me in Oxford as uninvidious, so I think we'll observe that tonight, and I'll start by saying something about Saskia Hamilton, the combination in her poems of modesty and mystery. They're very succinct, they're often cryptic and even enigmatic. Succinct in the sense that you tuck your clothes up uh, etymologically, you tuck your clothes up so that you can move with ease and grace, as these poems do. She is not afraid of the unobvious. Kieran Wynne is a Wordsworthian poet. He's a poet to whom Wordsworth matters a very great deal, both aspects of Wordsworth. The Wordsworth who writes of an ordinary sorrow of man's life, and the Wordsworth who writes of joy in widest commonality spread. He has learnt, Kieran has learnt from Wordsworth what Philip Larkin learnt from Hardy, not to be afraid of the obvious. Uh, so there's a beautiful pairing, I think, and complementarity tonight. Poetry readings don't need moderators, though it is true that if William Carlos Williams and T.S. Eliot had read on the same occasion, you would have done well to have a moderator. And if Geoffrey Hill and Philip Larkin were to read on the same occasion, you would need not a moderator but a referee, um, and even seconds to stanch the blood. Um, but I, I, So I'll reserve being any kind of moderator uh, for the discussion part of our evening's occasion. Our poets will read for 15 minutes or so and then we will see what they wish to say to one another and what we, we wish to say to them and to hear them say back to us. Thank you. Thank you Christopher and um, thank you to Vivian Schmidt and Meg Tyler and Agni Magazine and um, it's a, a real pleasure to read with Kieran Wynn, whom I heard read at um, Balliol um, a year ago with Rosanna Warren, Boston University's own. I'm going to read tonight from a book-length collection of poems not yet finished entitled Nightjar. And um, as many of you will know, that is a bird that looks like a hawk, flies at night, like an owl, but is actually related to the swifts, uh, to the hirondelles. It's quite a mysterious creature. Um, another interesting fact about night jars is that um, when they make their call, which is a bit like somebody running a few yards of cloth through a sewing machine, um, they can throw their voice, they're ventriloquists, so if you hear it, and you look over there, it's probably over there somewhere. And um, the place where I've seen one once only and heard, heard one several times is in the eastern, the Fen country in the eastern part of the Netherlands near the German border where I've been every year since I was uh, three. And um, the, the bird doesn't appear in every poem uh, necessarily. It's more of a tutelary spirit of the book um, and what else can I tell you? The landscapes are this, uh, this part of Holland. Uh, I'm sorry, the Netherlands. My, my Dutch uncle Otto would, would chastise me for calling it Holland um, because it's not, one of the, it's not one of the provinces of Holland. It's uh, um, one of the provinces of the Netherlands, Gelderland. Uh, France, uh, Britain, and of course the US. So. Night jar. In the first field, a man turns the hay. Not wrapped. Where there's ricks, there's gates. Six. Sufficient to the sojourner. To the day. We parked by the fourth field and descended the path cut by rainwater through fern, bark, and sticks litter of old walls where the forest encroached on dwelling. Down in the church, named for the saint, named for stone, the villagers of Thanatos, packed in, lie below the raised floor, feet stretched tentatively at the chancel. Tarp covers their teeth and jaws. 
lichen and mold, blue, the grinning lion, fish and worm. And outside, in the cleared valley, dandelion and poppies seed, unto the hour sufficient. The late long one begins in the wood. The bird's call seems to turn, though it is still in its bracken. Its round eye, somewhere in there, takes in the dark under the blackening canopy of branches. Reversal, portal. Hawking for moths at dusk, the nightjar in the fen near the worn stone markers of the old bishopric. Thence seeded to centuries of the forest, thence the fall, one by one, thence centuries underfoot of branch and brush and peat. Near you, but where it has gone, past the rides. Um, I'm going to either well, I'm going to try out some quite new poems on you, and I hope you survive, and I survive. Um, uh, my latest series in the sequence are a um, series of three poems, um, and I should just say that they, uh, three brief poems on a single page. The he's and she's don't necessarily um, interact or interrelate. They might, but it's not really um, narrative. Um, they, these three uh, are grouped, each of the threes are sort of grouped together for other reasons, other things that interested me. For example, in the first one, um, I was interested in silent ways of acknowledging something or vowing something um, um, through gesture. He took what was to be his final walk in the Volsifane late winter snow receding, the silver tip of his cane now broad, now narrow. Just beyond the path in the bracken, he knelt and sat on the ground as in a vowel, the watch wrapped in linen. If she ever acknowledged the name, it was only when no one was there to hear it. The silence sheltered something at home that had troubled the petitioner. He had fallen on the way, late as usual, needed tending. Never explain, he only ever said. She knelt and pulled the cloth from the mud. Linnet, she heard and named. The water eddied and pooled at her shoes. The bird, not visible, warm gray movement in the thicket. What else lay there the day at its end? The squelch of mud when she rose, a strip of linen clinging to her boot. So here's another one of the threes, and, this, and um, I was, um, just interested in the word next, because next, um, I think I read in private eye or somewhere like that, so making fun of um, instructions in uh, railway carriages where the language gets so convoluted it says, um, pull the lever adjacent to the door or something like that. And um, I, I was, of course, it should just be simply next or something. And then I thought about next as being you know, nice because it's about, um, it can refer to a sequence or, um, or proximity. He stands at the edge and crows rise from the field. The eastern side is cast in shadow. In the far pasture, sheep crowd in a circle. All are at rest, and yet nothing has yet been harvested. All wait for next day's work. Next patient, next patient, he says. They file through from the waiting room. Penitent? He turns to the attending and wakes. 
Beyond the house, a car moves along the south road. He races to dress, then sits on the bed, being no longer expected. Three weeks pass before she feels able to face it and is sorry for having said yes. Should she consult the volumes whose plain type shelters the labor of thousands? Dawn. On her desk, Mirandi's objects heard together on a postcard next to a jar of pencils. Bells woke us at eight set us to table at seven. Very late, we'd switch on the electric blanket and he would take off his shirt, my mouth on him. He took in the many mouths, windows open, all ajar, all tongues. Uh, this one has two voices and the clever one's not mine. Milk violet flies up from the wall on its mazy way to grass. If I call, I'll find you someplace en route, pausing at a shop window to gaze at the small article, dolphin coin, numismatic remains, vegetables, radios, recycled clothing. John obviously wants to interfere with her, but he keeps changing his mind all the time because he lives in a world where nothing ever happens. I fear he is about to enter a Shakespearean subplot. If I call, you will be in the bath, up and flipping your coin of story. As her every sentence bears witness, but then each sentence has too many exits. The bicycle rests against the low wall, jutting its front wheel onto the road, white tire bluing at dusk, aerospace, velospace, old transatlantic cable. Um, this one has a, um, Quotation uh, uh, from, dare I say it, the man himself, Beckett, stolen from him. But it is in quotation marks, so I'll acknowledge it somewhere. Um, and this is extremely minor compared to, obviously, the greatness that is Beckett. January rain, odd season. The day is over over there. A dog bays at traffic. Trucks come up the road from the bridge, bearing heads of lettuce to the city. Rain falters, lessens, then much, then little, then nothing. You are sleeping now, undone in the bedclothes over there. Here's a, one of the threes again. This is a small country, he said. There are too many trains. And then they get old and things break down and the system is complex and that makes for breaks and failures. Plants encroach on the tracks, the land encroaches, sweet gale, cotton grass. On Monday, she surveyed the calendar, tabling the hours of departure for the first and last trains between the three cities that sprawled together. If I miss the connection, she said, I can wait and have a coffee inside. Pigeons walked platform seven for the 0828. The moss encroached on trees, giant beach, slender beach, old leaves encroached, ivy and holly joined in dominion. One birch marked itself, another signaled from afar, leaves in ruts, leaves in ditches, ditch water and water on the path leading either out of the forest or further within. Are you surviving, by the way? These strange things. You're being very kind to take these in. Um, midsummer rain, then again, numbering the days. Then 40 more of heavy air. They arrange the order of the internal forest of hours in your absence. Or is it ours? The numbers fall short. In the shelter of the church, faces stare out of five leafy capitals. They do not speak their alarm. The donkey's ears rounding the bending road to Egypt. 
the angel falling headfirst into the virgin's womb. Inside their mouths of stone, do the dead yield? The tractor turns its giant forks to the field. Seed sorter, seed fixer, sacked. Petrochemical, body, the gut. Time to build a hospital for travelers. It's one more of the threes. She made a cup of tea and took up a pencil and book, reading lines aloud, ticking the good ones. She then smoked half a cigarette, pinched it closed, put it back in the packet. It's probably a big mistake, she said aloud, but couldn't place the remark. It's another quotation. Um, my bad con, <coughs> sorry. My bad conscience, sorry. I have a bad conscience. Right? <laughs> but this is not um, me or anyone I know, but anyway. My bad conscience was nothing other than terrible vanity, he said in interview. And I was terribly cruel. So I don't have anything to do with conscience now. They went outdoors and stood by the boats on shore pointing at outness. When the phone rang, she spoke to her sister for hours. I would go so far as to say, she would say. She watched as neighbors moved, uh, she watched as neighbors from across the way moved past their windows. The room grew darker. In so far as, she would say. She went as far as that. Just two more poems. Um, this is the last one from the night jar. Hodgepodge. I dreamt I wrote to X around the borders of a piece of hatched paper he had written on. Alternate wheat and fallow, some exhaustion land. It is said that after paradise, after a time, the unfallen animals came down the road and went their separate ways. Peacock, boar, pheasant, rabbit. Small birds roved the fields and hedges, expanding understories of holly and woodlands, spitting rain, successes and lapses. Plots have in the drawing plans for second floor passages in the first house. Wheat begins growing. And then lastly, with fear and trembling in this august audience, um, a version, very much a version, not a translation of an Anglo-Saxon riddle. This is riddle 39. They've never been able to figure out what the answer to it is, although they have some guesses. So this is my I hope not terrible butchering of Riddle 39. It is written in scriptures that this creature appears plainly to us when the hour calls, while its singular power compels and confounds our knowing. It seeks us out, one by one, following its own way, fares on with its stranger's step, never there a second night, native to no place, moves according to its nature. It has no hands, no feet, has never touched the ground, no mouth to speak of, nor mind. Scriptures say it is the least of anything made. It has no soul, no life but travels widely among us in this world. No blood, nor bone, but consoles all the children of men. It hasn't reached heaven, it won't touch hell, but takes instruction from the king of glory. The whole story of its fate, limbless as it is, animate, 
is too obscure to tell. And yet, all the words we find to describe it are just and true. If you can say it, call it by its rightful name. Thank you. Can you hear that? Do I have? Oh, there we go. There we go. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very grateful for being invited. Does this extend up a bit? Is this, is this as high as it will? Okay, I'll need it. It'd be nice to say some of these quietly. Last time I said these in England, I had to shout in a college hall in Oxford. So I'm Glad of a good mic. I'm very grateful to be here. I've had a fantastic 10 days all over Massachusetts, including a couple of notable poetic moments, uh, one of which was when I was sitting in Amherst, minding my own business, and Richard Wilbur, who, whose work I love, walked past. And if you don't know Richard Wilbur's work, I think he's a, he's a wonderful American poet. He's 88, but still strong as, a, strong as an oak. And um, I bothered him briefly, and he was very charming. And uh, I, I, I urge you to read Wilbur if you don't already. Uh, and yesterday I was taken around the Dry Salve Ages, uh, which you may know are the subject of the third of Eliot's four quartets. Um, and that was, I've now seen all four quartet sites, uh, and they are uncanny, all of them. Uh, I'm going to read about a dozen poems, the first of which is sometimes taken as ironic, but I don't mean it as ironic. The gentleman bowls along, the gentleman bowls along, and flourishing his cane creates new symbols in the morning air. His face is sanguine pink, his waistcoat half unbuttoned. His liquid eyes reflect stout cattle, orderly hedge. His brimming heart spills some runaway laughter. With happiness to hand in breathing, seeing, paradise for man cannot be far away. Legends. The day that you and I first played those songs, whose bright fragments lay scattered through our lives, in pubs, at parties, next to building sites, I thought that heaven rebuilt from far-flung blocks, love's perfection, all things fully known, would be like Penny Lane or Shall We Dance all the way through in the soaring, pure performance, loud and clear, as often as we want. Uh, my parents have now moved to Cornwall, on the, uh, the, the, the uh, western tip of England. Um, and I suppose the nearest thing to here, pretty much. Uh, and uh, we used to uh, holiday there as a family when I was a boy. And I, when I went back to visit them in their retirement for the first time, I suddenly realised that, that although I hadn't thought about Cornwall for a long time, I knew it implicitly. I knew the sand, I knew the, I knew the, I knew the, 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 the taste, almost literally, of the, of the water, the, 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 the way the salt becomes arcane in the palate. And so this reminded me of, of um, Plato's idea of anamnesis, which as you may know, says that we all experience reality before we are born. And then when we're incarnated in this fleshy clay, we forget it, but we can remember it. And that, and that the truth is not, as somebody said, out there, um, but, uh, but is something which we can remember, or as Anamnesis puts it, unforget. Unforgetting. Flat, shining fields of sand, the shallow carving Tigris and Euphrates of the beach streams, where individual flying grains are seen, the wet compactions out of which grew keeps I used to raise with greyish slapped moat water, enthralled and never doubting I was loved. Blue-black rock, its surface softened by salt, 
Like miniature coast, the coming wave would ruin Caves that had ground no man had trodden All stored when the soul passed here before this life Restarted by a sleepy train's long snaking The next poem is about the Romantic poets, Wordsworth and Coleridge, but it's not really about them. It's really about two modes of being and, and about how much, <laughs> how even if, like me, you love long walks in the country and that sort of thing, sometimes nature can seem just a little muddy. Uh, it's a very short poem. There's only about probably 18 words in it, so I must try and make my introduction tactfully shorter than that. But you need to know that Wordsworth and his family ate a lot of porridge when they were in Dove Cottage. They ate it twice a day, which once drove poor Sir Walter Scott, who was staying with them, and was going mad with porridge, to uh, climb. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm off now to work on Ivanhoe, Wordsworth, see you at lunch, and, uh, or see you this evening. And, and in fact, he crawled out of the window and, and went down the road to the Swan Hotel uh, and, and had a very meaty sort of dinner, lunch. Um, and, uh, and it was only caught out when, uh, when um, he and Wordsworth both ran into the innkeeper the next day and the innkeeper, innkeeper said something terribly unfortunate like, oh, you're you know, not coming for your usual today, Sir Walter, or something like that. Lots of porridge. And I, I like the way that porridge sounds like Coleridge as well. <laughs> um, Skiddaw, as you may know, is a very, very large, classic-looking mountain in the Lake District in the north of England. And the last line the last word of the last line, refers to a, a terrible row that Wordsworth and Coleridge had, a terrible falling out from which they never quite recovered. And um, <clears throat> one of the causes of the falling out was the belief of Coleridge that Wordsworth had called him the last word in the poem. I broke my rule, didn't I? Here, here come the 19 words. Wordsworth and Coleridge. Insufficient the broad oaten flakes, the convictions plain as skiddor. How Coleridge would have loved neon, glutamates, and so many channels, intricate, hair-like, in the end, a nuisance. A Victorian Dreams of Heaven. Let heaven be a great sweet thaw of love gone cold in time or the grave. The taking of hands never thought to be taken again. The old light in the eyes. Let heaven be a great sweet thaw of love made numb by jealousy. Love that dared not act because acting would scald and scar like fire. Let heaven be an utter release from fear. I live in a Victorian house very near a um, Victorian graveyard. Um, and uh, much of England is filled up with dead Victorians. And, and, they're, and they're, no, it's quite true, and we can't be buried anymore because, because they've taken all the plots. It's perfectly true, we have to be cremated now. Um, and, and these, these you know, imperial tombs are gradually being redesignated nature reserves and, and very rare kinds of dormouse and beetle are allowed to, allowed to multiply there. It's a poem, the next one, about how um, uh, even if the, the god, the Victorians, in many cases felt they had lost, even if he doesn't exist, we still inevitably belong to the universe. Victorians. Near our Victorian house, Victorian graves. That age's loss of God can still be seen, a realism in the grains of the day, as though the heavenly glory has expired, leaving the railway and the angular cranes, the straggling blackberries and the merchant Thames. Slowly, I trawl an open hand along a cold, wet street sign, and the living carbon meets iron with a kind of holy aptness, far from ideas and far from centuries. I have a few more, but I'd just like a sip of water. <clears throat> I 
don't know if anyone particularly <laughs> you know, follows this or has noticed this, um, but we're down to the absolute last tiny bit of thread of living memory of World War I. There are only three people in the world who, who um, uh, fought in the First World War, um, two of whom saw service, one of whom was an Englishman who now lives in Australia called Claude Chules, uh, and one of whom is an American called Frank Buckles, who is 108 and has a very informative website um, um, about his time in, uh, on the Western Front in 1917. So look up Frank Buckles. This is a composite poem of a couple of the last British veterans, including Chules. A British veteran. A hand that held a rifle on the climb to Passchendaele now bears a bubbling flute. His hand is strong and rubicund, his frame mobile and actual as he toasts his eight Australian great-great-grandsons. Woolen cloth is covering his body now as then. That hand will soon slip under the stream of myth. No one thinks Agincourt was fought by men. Uh, this one, I'm pleased to say, is coming out in agony very soon, uh, if you want to uh, you know, follow it up. Uh, two poems, short poems, about the um, things you find at the foot of gardens. Compost. Mounds like grey grass huts that grew at the foot of tidy gardens, forkable and moist, dilapidated, harmless, almost friendly, Sweet mulching down of much that had been living. Hair that mounts up grey on a barber's floor. And the bonfire before lighting. Dropleted twigs with mouldy ashen coats jutted out with thorns, made caves within. A blackbird's corpse, a slow worm's, all would go. Dissolution, absolute absence of girders, of intellectual property, baroque scales. Here's a poem about our um, uh, addiction to the news. I, I used to wake up to Radio 4 in, in, uh, in Britain, if you've heard that, and you would wake up with a terrible jolt to Robin Cook or someone being grilled in, in the radio car, whatever that was. And it's a, very, it's a terrible way to wake up, and I now wake up to Radio 3, and consequently I'm planning to live a lot longer. Uh, I don't think we have to know everything first thing. I think it becomes a, a terribly anxiety-inducing habit, really. Uh, unless, you know, the government's on our street, clearly. That, that, that's different. Waking. Beside you in the landscape of the bed, a lightsome cellular warmth behind the eyes, balance and hunger, coolness on the covers, each muscle moved, a full rewarding joy, half dreaming of tea with the distant and the dead, your flesh the colour of rose and half shadows, your warmth annihilating metaphysics, a great ring of light through a floor in the window, and then the radio alarm clock coughs and brings our armour with the needless first word, gunmen. I'm very struck, this is my second visit to this bit of the world, and I'm very struck by how uh, it really does look um, a, a, lot, a lot like home in many ways. So I hope you'll forgive this little, uh, this little uh, um, uh, summer holiday around England. Um, it starts in Cornwall, uh, then goes to Kent, where I grew up, which is on the far east, southeastern tip, the Garden of England, they call it. Uh, and then to the Lake District in the north, and then to Oxford. July. Ice creams, veranda, sparkling Cornish Bay. Old men look jaunty classic in the sunlight. Roman consuls slightly down at heel. And children swim out to a floating platform beyond the boats with names of girls and fays. Out in the small, unwinding, vein-like lanes, where everything runs out before the sea, the chlorophyll in salty grass 
is yielding willingly to candescent, lifting light. Elsewhere, the verdant Agincourt discipline of men of Kent trees cut out from the pattern, long hourless afternoons in pubs on greens. And on the fell sides, nature at her gaudy, old Catholic colours in the sky and thorn, lake like a giant blue, tough-skinned, basking lizard, all colours thick as in a childhood film stock. In Oxford, students, sleek with many an A, dawdle down the river, playing their part, and languid fellows decorate the meadows. Imperial ironies are cultivated in their straw hats and floppy creasing suits. Summer professional yet legendary, great banner in the heavens, read by all. And I think two more, two more. The next one is about, it might almost have had the title of Damien Hirst's Shark, which sounded like a bit of a scam, really, but, but, but I think in, 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 you know, in, in, in its presence, it was very impressive. It was called, you know what I mean, the, the pickled shark. And it was called, it looked very fierce, but it was in formaldehyde, and, and it didn't know it was dead. Um, and it was, it was called something like the impossibility of death in the mind of something living. Sometimes when I wake up from my afternoon nap, I, I feel... I feel very um, Larkin-esque about death, really, which otherwise I don't. Um, I, I feel very sad and, like, time's running out. So this is about waking up on the train to London. You and sunlight, houses and graves and motion, and with the must of ancient album pages, or the sense I am adrift upon an ocean, I feel a final hour has to come. But how can I conceive of such a stricture who have a timeline of the Middle Ages, have watched so many aliens, and can picture Moses and Robespierre and the tribe of gum? So we uncurl from seats as cramped as cribs, seeming to fall or sift as if through sieves. We walk beneath gigantic whale-like ribs then step into the London afternoon like dauntless clerks of 1883, or smart young 60s TV executives dreaming of life in the 21st century. Open marriage, jetpacks on the moon. As Charlie, who I'm staying with, said last night, where's my jetpack? And finally, a, a walk in the Lake District, which if you don't know, I hope you will visit one day. Uh, it's from the village of Ambleside to another village in Glen Ridding. Uh, there are various place names. Rydal Water and Brothers Water are lakes. Gold Rill and Scandale Beck are streams. Fairfield's a mountain. The Traveler's Rest is a pub. I think that's all you need to know. They're, I hope, happy incantations, even if you don't know the area. Ambleside to Glen Ridding in, uh, not, I was about to say, in memory of the person, sorry, for the person who, uh, who I did it with. How are you feeling? You all right? Good. Okay. Not, not, in, not in memory of, sorry. <laughs> for Amanda Holton, Ambleside to Glen Ridding. The 18th century notes Rydal Water glittering in a prospect by Scandale Beck climb on a pony track past meteorite grottos to high Sweden bridge, a lone constructed eye, a glimpse of civilization. Then press on to a pre-human valley in the mountains, networked by veins of thin and plashable streams. Now up, an easy up, with Fairfield left, mist and moisture cool on grateful limb, loved wideness, thereness, love like sun on stone, to a broken ridge, the start of dirty walking, oikish grass and ankle-killing holes. But there is light and we have time and food. So brother's water inches round a hill, lake like a flat grey pebble. And reaching earth, we head past waterfall and fiery fern, past gold drill to the silver spill of Ull's water, its miles of absolute edge as mild as Jesus. Then to the traveller's rest for woods floor beer, rich seasoned beef, potatoes piping, whiskey and shortbread, fire and sugar for the next day. Thank you.
Oh, it's not working. And so I'll just speak. I'll ask our poets just to inquire of one another for a moment, and then we will open it to the floor. Let's bear in mind that among the many auspices that we enjoy this evening, an important one is the sense of internationalisms, of nationalisms, of different places, of different times, of what combination of similitude and dissimilitude meets you when you go perhaps to the Netherlands, perhaps to America. That's, the, that's one of the large areas that we should be thinking about, areas themselves. But let me just ask, ask you if you have anything you would wish to put to Kieran about your sense of, of place in relation to civilization, the word that figured very important, and then vice versa, and then we will open it to the floor. Will you do something I... Is this on? Can you, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, you do something I wish I could do, um, which I, um, which is to um, um, find and say what what the meaning of a particular experience might be, and uh, as it were, I don't know if that makes sense or if that if that's um, um, an accurate um, account. Um, but Christopher said at the at the start. Um, that your work was Wordsworthian, and in fact, my memory of your reading in Balliol, and then again this time, was what kept coming into my mind was that one of my favorite Wordsworth poems, which is um, the um, uh, old man traveling, animal tranquility, and, de and decay. Which you alluded to in uh, in your line about the, um, uh, uh, the the line about the hospitals. I thought alluded to that. Oh my God! Yes. You're what, what, right. What's the line? What's the line? Oh, have I just spotted the? The time to build a hospital for travellers, but I hadn't been thinking. Well, about that, you know, that, I mean, there we go. Travelling, and, and the last line is yes. um, the last line is uh, um, they're going to uh, what's the last Christmas? And there thing? is dying in a hospital. Exactly. Or thank you. and there is lying in a hospital. Yes. Well, <laughs> which is a very, the very telling variant in yes. the end of the poem. Yes. Well, and it's also it's such, such yeah. an interesting choice, um, like whether a, an editor will include. There are two versions of the poem. Most of you, I'm sure you most of you know this, but there are two versions of the poem. One that ends, um, and there is lying in a hospital, and the other which ends. Um, I think it's six lines earlier, um, and um, just ends with Wordsworth's. Um, articulating his he is by nature led to be so perfect that the young behold with envy what the old man hardly feels <laughs> we, we rehearsed this no we rehearsed this extensively they didn't. please they do really not didn't. be taken really in yeah. <laughs> um, yes so, uh, so what, what, what was the final clause of your question well <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just think that that uh, there are th that the choice between uh, ending it with Wordsworth's thought about the old man and then ending it with wor with the old man's words, yes, um, yes. enigmatically somewhat flat, m m perhaps more flat, yeah. Yeah. but um, uh, certainly more shocking. Um, the the, the, the yes. second version. Um, and um, I think that to, to remain, to be content, I think, to, and, uh, to, to end with one's own thought about the thing, yes. um, I think is something that I wish I could do. For some reason, I, um, I try to, you know, but I, it never seems to work. So, uh, but I'm just curious about your, this is not really much of a question, it's sort no, of a No, it ramble, is, it's very, it's, it's very flattering, and thank you. It, it's, um, it's what I'd like to feel I did, although I'm, the way you phrased the, uh, the question reminded me of um, Eliot's lines in, um, I think it's uh, Dry South Ages, isn't it? About how we had the experience, or is that East Coker? We had the, exp we had the experience but missed the meaning and approach to the meaning restores the experience in a different form beyond any meaning we can assign to happiness. But it's yeah. like and, the difference and, and, and between... And so yeah. yeah, so I, 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 I remember wanting when I was an undergraduate very much to be able to... Um, uh, I, I, I aspire to looking something in the face in a poem. And, and, um, but I think the great danger is that, is that one then becomes hectoring. And in fact, I've recently been trying to assemble a collection and I, and I had to cut about three or four poems because they were basically making the point in my poem Victorians about how we belong to the physical world, whether we like it or not, and that we're always at home here inevitably. Um, I, I, felt I, was, I felt I was making the same point over and over again. And I, and I think the great danger with, with that 
with that approach of mine, is that is that um, is that one becomes doctrinaire and repetitive. So I, I, I that's that's the downside. But I, I, as long as I don't become that, I'm very happy. But, uh, well, I don't think so. No. Thank you. But uh, but um, but it, it is in a way also like the difference between the Eliot of the Wasteland and Eliot of, four, of the Four Quartets. Uh, yes, that's true. That's true. W which do you prefer? This is the no, but uh, people tend to like one or the other. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, well, I adore all of it. Yeah. Um, but I suppose that the first Eliot that got to me when I was very was was too young to understand anything was the Wasteland. Yes. I suppose so. I suppose that that is closer to my heart. But yeah. but very quickly, I love the Four Quartets as well. It's very. Um, I, um, I the, 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 to think about. I mean, the, genuinely, the Wasteland. Scares me now, you know, and and, and the idea, well, by, by which I mean, in a, in a good way, I just find the language of the wasteland, in the best possible sense, terrifying. Uh, and and I, what reading it in 1922 must have been like, I, I, I shudder to think it must have been. I mean, you can quite see why his reputation formed so quickly. I once asked uh, um, uh, an old poet, old then, called Kathleen Rain, who at the time was 90. Mm about reading The Wasteland in the 20s. And she was then part of a fashionable Cambridge set. Um, and she said, well, we all thought, all the 20-year-olds thought, how can this American understand 20-year-olds in Britain so well? How can he know what we're going through? But, but, but then 70 years later, she said she had realized that actually he hadn't realized what they were going through at all. It, it, it had all just been some extraordinary tonal coincidence and, and, and mm -hmm. what he was writing about was something very private and really it was his own it was a spiritual autobiography i think um yes it's it's very i wouldn't it be interesting if um if pound had been given a chance to get to the quartets i mean if, if we could have had a sort of two book prelude and a 12 book prelude with the quartets that would have been fun wouldn't it i once edited down the wasteland just for fun because it it seemed a bit miserable. And uh, if you know the poem, and you, you just take out the, the lines that are you know, not as cheerful as they could be. Um, it's, it begins, summer surprised us <laughs> coming over the Starnbergers Day with a shower of rain. And it ends, um, I sat upon the shore fishing. And it's only, about, it's only about 35 lines long, but in some ways it's a much more satisfactory poem. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I am, I am sorry. Christopher's currently editing the collected T.S. Eliot and probably wants to put in my version now. But yeah. That way madness lies. <laughs> Let's open the floor and perhaps if we can see if we can start with something that might connect, as it were, with landscapes. That is, the Eliot of landscapes is, is the Eliot both of the early poems and of the later poems. I'm wondering if anybody would like to ask a question or put a point that turns on the very, very different landscapes that we've um, been hearing about and imagining. There's a, there's a microphone. Please, a question. I'm not sure I have a question in this exactly, but I just wanted to uh, make a comment as a, as a, a lay reader of poetry uh, and a lay listener of, of uh, poetry beautifully read, that it is very striking um, the difference in the, uh, in the apprehension of the landscape in uh, both uh, poets' work. Um, and, and, um, and, and I think in, in many ways, uh, you know, exciting to see the differences emerge. Um, uh, Saskia, your poems reminded me very much of my you know, seven years of being an American in Europe and seeing things that I couldn't quite describe absolutely perfectly exactly, but that I knew, and that sense of being, uh, of being uh, amid a landscape that, that has somehow um, foreign and yet, um, and yet uh, you know, a, a perfect uh, perfectly familiar at the same time. I, 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 there was, that was a very uh, powerful uh, sentiment that I got from your poetry. Whereas uh, Kieran's poems, you know, are absolutely rooted in exactly where they are, uh, which is, I don't think, um, uh, unrelated to the point that you were just making about uh, him saying exactly what he means uh, um, uh, towards the ends of the poem. And I'm just wondering if, if there's a difference uh, in, or if, you, if the two of you might want to talk about uh, the difference in your apprehensions of the landscapes, how you have come to know them and how you've come to describe them and wh what effect that has on your poetical voices. Um, thank you. Um, very interesting question. 
I don't, it's curious, perhaps my, perhaps the sense of um, location and dislocation that you were picking up on um, might have something to do with the odd locations and dislocations just of my, my fate or circumstance or whatever, which is, um, I'm half Dutch. And um, uh, I was raised by, it, it, I was raised very curiously by four people from four quite distinct cultures. Um, uh, one was uh, American, Washington, D.C., where I grew up. Um, one was uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where my father's family is from. One is um, African American from Washington, D.C., my stepfather who raised me um, um, and uh, was a, a great and honorable and wonderful man um, uh, who had a big influence in my life. And then my Dutch family, which was like a giant matriarchy and um, um, we were we were delivered there for two months every year. Um, and so finding my bearings um, for, in all these different worlds, some of which were uh, uncomfortable with the others, uh, particularly the Southern uh, family was a bit uncomfortable with my black stepfather um, and that culture I was learning from, um, meant having to kind of read, um, try and read and understand um, habits of mind, habits of thought, habits of reading, habits of um, interacting, um, and try and, um, well, learn from them, I suppose. So I, th there is a sense, and, and also with languages, because my, my Dutch family, I had an uncle who used to correct my English. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle Otto, he was raised by an English nanny and he didn't approve of my American. Um, um, so, uh, dreaming a little bit over Dutch and um, <sighs> dreaming a little bit over English, I suppose. Um, yeah. I, I, so I think that that dis dislocation, location, those sort of on one foot, hopping from foot to foot all the time, is certainly uh, descriptive of my. Thank my you. Please. Yes, um, I I can only say that I, I don't know how much I should how much I should give away really probably something. Um, I, I think partly because of, I mean, the great, the great um, unspoken presence in, 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 in a lot of my poems, I'm not sure about these ones tonight, maybe the Victorians one, the great unspoken presence is God, and I was unlucky enough to have a, uh, to have a, 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 a couple of hellfire sermons in an, in an Anglican church, for goodness sake, which, uh, which rather got to me. And I think, I think as a very conscientious boy, um, I, but there were various things which led to this terrible sense that everything was about to go, you know? And I was terribly conscientious at school and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And, 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 I was, and I, 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 I'm fascinated by the fact <laughs> that the Lake District has, as I say, a, a, a there-ness, a solidness, um, and, and actually can't really go. You are, to your last breath, a part of nature. Um, I don't mean to imply I'm now con constantly, you know, on, on the edge of my seat, but I used to be. Um, and I remember when I was 18, uh, going to the Lake District for the first time and walking away from the, the lay-by where my parents had parked and, and just pottering down myself to Thirlmere. And I simply couldn't believe how beautiful the colors were. I simply, it was, I think in, uh, practically until that moment, I hadn't really understood the difference between, a, if you like, a desk and a, 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 and a tree. <laughs> they were all, I, I was very cerebral. I was, very, I was a very cerebral, you know, swattish, swatty youth, really. And, and, and suddenly this, the colors exploded and, and, and I, 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 I was in love, really. Um, and I, 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 I think of, I mean, I, I know not everyone likes long walks in the rain, but, but I, I do really do think of long walks in the countryside um, as, a, as a sort of private emblem of life, you know, moving around here, um, letting the body uh, settle into its, into its, um, into its happiness. Uh, there's not much that a 10-mile walk won't, won't cure. 
So, yeah. Thank you. That, yeah. Other questions, please, or observations? Can I ask a question from here? No, I think, there's, I think it's being recorded for posterity. Okay, so I hope this question will um, expand upon the last gentleman's question. Hopefully we'll explore it further even. Um, I just wanted to ask about the effect of technology uh, on both poets' experience of the physical world, um, or actually more like your, your rendition of the experience of the physical world, and also um, on the experience of landscapes, and on the experience of, um, of nature, or even you know a mere walk in the park, or even a 10-mile walk. Um, I guess, Karen, specifically, I was interested by your reference in one of your later poems to, um, to jetpacks as a possible reference to, to technology, maybe in a, in a humorous or satirical or even cynical way. Um, once again, my question is, right, what's the effect of technology on your experience of nature? Thanks. Do, do, uh, it's not fair for you to go first always, is it? OK. <laughs> the, the, effect, the, the effect of technology. Um, I don't think it has any direct effect on. Uh, well, I tell you, I do have a lot. I do have several poems um, to do with DVDs, actually. Um, I, I, well, I, I have a little, and I, I, um, I, I do love the. Um, let, let, let me see if I can recite a short poem which, which includes a bit of technology. Um, the silver birch. The silver birch against heraldic sky is all-consuming. What I'm walking through is both my garden on a crisp March morning under this bounding, binding human blue and a mind cleared of its old reports and annuals. All that I see is live. I gaze and gaze. This is full screen in brilliant definition. <laughs> I could be wrapped at winter's grayest grays. Uh, I do, I, 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 so I, I love the, um, I tell you, I, I, I love the way you can recapture the past through technology. I'm fascinated by the way you can recapture old 70s TV shows. Uh, and, and there they all are again forever. You know, I, 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 um, uh, as far as direct influence on, I mean, I, 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 I think the world of computers, I mean, I, 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 I love the cleanliness of computers, that lucent screen. I, 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 I adore it. But I don't think it's had a great deal of effect um, beyond some particular images on, 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 my, on my walking or, 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 or poetry. Saskia. I feel, can I just oh, check? Please. I feel like a judge and ought to have a wig and would be allowed to say, what is a jet pack? <laughs> uh, in the way in which they used to say, what is a beetle? When there was an argument about music. What and is a so now, What is a jet pack? I genuinely don't know. Can someone demonstrate, perhaps? <laughs> what is it? Does someone, uh, a jet pack? Yeah. You mean it's in the Kama Sutra? No. Nah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not being someone paid that demonstrate? much. Someone uh, demonstrate? <laughs> Saskia. No, 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 that'd be wrong. Uh, a jetpack is one of those things that um, 40 or 50 or 60 years ago, in, these, in those wonderful um, visions of the, of the near future, uh, we were going to be getting around by, instead of, instead of the, you know, commuting by car, you would have a little, you know, a little like a backpack tied to your back, which would have its own little NASA-style rockets, and you would just fly to work. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, if um, technology on the one hand is um, my deplorable total addiction to the news, uh, particularly since last September um, and the lead up to the election. I, I just became completely addicted um, and I'm trying to break it. It's horrible. Um, but, um, but in terms of technology and landscape, um, I'm not quite sure I have an answer except that I, Picking up on the business of recordings, um, uh, it's nice to be able to bring music or recordings out into on, on a walk, which I occasionally do. Um, and I'm so grateful that um, uh, that uh, recordings of um, poets reading um, their poems and other sorts of things are increasingly available, readily available. And I love that. So I, I do spend. I was a kind. Of, I was. I was a. I was a punk rocker when I was in seventh grade. I was in a band. Um, I'm obsessed with music, um, and uh, I like to fiddle with things like that. So I, I spend an inordinate amount of time when I'm not reading the news um, trying to find old recordings. 
I, well, well, one supplementary thing to that is, of course, how incredibly lucky we are to have to have recordings of, of the long dead. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary to think we have film of T.S. Eliot, who largely avoided the camera, but there's this fantastic snippet of him reading um, The Dove Descending Breaks the Air, part four of Little Gidding. Um, do you, do you know that, Christopher? Have you, have you seen that? It's, it's, well, I don't know how rare I, it is. I just take that up. I mean, the terrible thing in that arena program, well, one terrible thing was that I was allowed four seconds uh, so that <laughs> somebody was just saying, there's Gramps, and it had already gone. I mean, my grandchildren were deprived of this kind of quasi-immortality. But much more important than that was that the BBC believes that you can't have the patience actually to listen to a poem without being given a picture of something. Eliot takes a lot of trouble to give you pictures of things very beautifully with his words you then have a picture so if the lines are about water you have a picture of some water uh, but he'd been very good at bringing water home to you without showing you a picture of it so they got bored they got bored with Eliot you didn't watch Eliot reading it you cut immediately to something else it's down to these tiny sight bites I mean sound bites are bad enough but sight bites I think are really terrible on the other hand there are some good things in it please <laughs> Thank you. The awkwardness of having to walk to those uh, things. Speaking of Eliot, he of course embraced qu many quotations from many other poets in his own work, and various kinds of homage quotation uh, is common. And there is some concern among the legal community that copyright might be restraining poets' spontaneity because of fears of liability. Um, do you have any views about copyright whatsoever? I think it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Um, I should because uh, my, my Dutch family, they're all, um, my grandfather was a member of the Supreme Court, in fact, given this <laughs> room, is wonderful. Um, and an aunt who was an expert uh, on copyright law. Um, I don't, but I don't know enough, I really, I, I don't have any legal training. I'm the only one in my family who's poor and um, without legal training, almost. Um, uh, but I, it does make me think about the business of um, um, illusion. Of course, Christopher is um, the source um, of clear thinking on this subject and um, the way in which uh, so much of it is unconscious. So Kieran, you said, oh, there was a, I thought of Wordsworth when I read the thing about the hospital, and of course I had no notion of that. And there was a wonderful letter someone once sent me um, that uh, T.S. Eliot wrote to Alan Tate, um, who was a poet of some prominence in the 30s and 40s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And he had a young student named Robert Lowell, and it was 1943 when um, I guess Eliot must have been writing the Little Gidding, and lo the early Lowell poems that he he had been sent, student poems, were um, written when Lowell had been a recent convert to the Catholic Church, and they were very they were quite self-conscious poems. And Eliot wrote to Alan Tate that he was interested in the work of this young poet and wants, wanted to know what would become of him. But he said that I feel that his religious convictions have not not yet sunk to the level of the unconscious where they can rise again as material for poetry. And I think the same is true of his literary, and then he writes morals and crosses it out and then writes models. The same is true of his literary models. And I've always loved that there was that Freudian slip um, of uh, literary models being somehow close in his mind perhaps to literary morals. But I think that the unconscious, that, that, that illusion is unconscious, um, is, I think, um, largely true, wouldn't you say? Um, I, I didn't hear the last well, word. Well, I mean, uh, l largely, oh, largely true, yeah. largely true. That illusion is unconscious. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm sure that's true. And, and, and Eliot himself, about one line of the wasteland um, that alludes to the white devil, even with his great consciousness of what he was up to, even he, you know, would, would um, I think, admitted about one line in the way so that, yeah, okay, maybe that was the, um, yes, it's, I, 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 I'm very in favor of copyright, I must admit. 
and and um, I, I I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm appalled when um, uh, when vast chunks of people's uh, collected poems. I mean, all of Eliot is available freely on the internet. I don't I don't understand why people aren't more frightened of the Eliot estate or something. But I mean, genuinely, it, it does seem to be taking a taking a liberty, and I I, I wonder if these people people who do this wholesale maybe don't realize how poems come into being, which is often in a very stalagmite, stalactite sort of way, and it's, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work. And I think we're entitled to make our, our pennies from it. Um, that, that was the original question, wasn't it? Yes, but we then came on to illusion, which is, which is, which is, um, uh, which is a, uh, an interesting matter too. Talking about Lowell and Eliot, I hadn't realized until this visit um, that, that, that Lowell House and Eliot House are uh, you know are, are, are both so 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 visible and so parallel on the Boston skyline, and I think Eliot very much felt that Lowell was was a was a worthy successor and, and sort of mm. you know later in life I think he I think he is that right I think I, I think he bestowed on Lowell a certain it a was certain it was held you know. that um, Mr Eliot's having invited Mr Lowell to remain on stage That's for right. a reading <laughs> instead of taking a seat in the <laughs> audience indicated a clear passing of on of a, of a mantle. Uh, one of the things they delighted, of course, it's in the Lowell poem, uh, Eliot saying to Lowell, don't you loathe to be compared to your relatives? That's true. Uh, and that's, that's the world of uh, President Eliot of Harvard and President Lowell. Uh, they, they, so there's a curious, they have in common uh, the wish to get the hell out of Harvard. <laughs> but could we, Christopher, what, what are your views on copyright? Yes. And you're well, the one we want to hear from. Well, it. I was hoping, I, Wendy, I don't know if you'd say more about this matter. I know it's a great con concern to you. Um, Wendy Gordon uh, specializes within the law school in some of these key questions about intellectual property and whether or not they will stand between people and new creativity. And I certainly thought that the recent uh, Catcher in the Rye case was very, very disconcerting. Here you have a book that never, never names Holden Caulfield, uh, but it can't, as I I understand it be published because it is held to breach Salinger's copyright. But I don't know if you'd like to say something sort of brief about this because I think it's of interest to Very everybody. Very briefly, um, what puzzles me is that the academic community is very worried about the restraints on your creativity. Will Bob Dylan write as many songs now that people accuse him of copyright infringement from the Yakuza book? Um, uh, But the puzzlement that I have is despite all of us academics worrying about creators' freedoms to allude and quote freely, it doesn't seem to bother real poets at all that copyright is out there. Um, most often the response I get is the response you gave tonight, which they see the virtues of copyright more than the vices of it. And Thank you. That's why I raised it. Thank you very much. Can I, can I ask, is it, is it being led at all by, um, by uh, um, fears over student plagiarism? Um, I, mean, I mean, does that, does that come into it too? And is no, that I think that the, the ethic of um, what you might call anti-copyright has to do with the incredibly long term extension. So the copyrights take hundred, over 100 years uh, yes. to expire. And certain other, what you might call abusive extensions Plus some cases like the one Christopher alludes to where you see some interference from free speech, where you see parodic works um, that have a very rocky time getting to publication. For example, an Afro-American woman's version of The Wind, yes. Gone with the Wind, was actually taken off the shelves for a while if she hadn't had a super committed publisher who eventually got a court ruling that put the things back on. We never would have seen the satire, um, the, the Wind Done Gone. Thank you. Other, let, let's move on to other questions or observations, please. Thank you. I'm very much a lay reader of poetry, but from what I could tell, both of you have a very modern voice, as opposed to postmodern, from what I could tell. And I wish you would just say something about cadence and meaning in your poetry, because I both, I, with both of you, I very much sense a sort of, a sort of cadence, especially with science poetry. I very much sense a sort of, of cadence, and I'm wondering if you could say something about that. Modern more than postmodern, you said? I don't know. 
Yeah. No, no, no. No, no, no. But, I mean, no, it's interesting because, it, I mean, I, I, I don't... It's, I'm, my mind is circular, thinking, thinking circularly, but, but, it, but it is true that the first poets that uh, mattered... Uh, mattered to me is as the first poets that mattered to many many people um, uh, were Stevens and Eliot and so when I um, I think of them as sort of true north as it were I don't you know so I I I, I admire um, um, tremendously um, Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, more post, I, I guess you would call them postmodern poets. But I don't think of them, I don't look to them for mu musical inspiration or, 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 or um, um, I read them more out of interest than out for inspiration. And perhaps that just ends up showing up in, in the language. And so maybe the language is, is a little bit old fashioned by now. I don't know. Um, um. Yes, I think I think I'm 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 not sure. I mean, this, but, but when you phrase it like that, it's it's an interesting it's interesting to, to to notice about my work that I don't think it now particularly owes a great deal to. I think it it could almost have been written, at, uh, um, in in the nineteenth or very early twentieth century. I'm not sure it owes a lot to to modern in the capital M sense of of Eliot and Stevens. I mean, I adore Eliot deeply, but I um I'm 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 I I think it's in a it's in, a, it's in a tradition which, if anything, I remember Christopher you describing um, Larkin once on an, on an old TV show as, as um, completely uneccentric in his in his in the, in, in his in, 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 in the tradition that he that he followed. And I, I would like to think, if it isn't if it isn't um, arrogating too much, that, that 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 I'm I'm sort of uneccentric in that in that English tradition which goes from Wordsworth through Hardy and 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 so I I, I adore many modern poets. Um, but I, but I, but I think I'm in a, I'm in a tradition which, as it happens, doesn't doesn't take a great deal from the capital M modern. As far as the cadences, guys, I, I, I wonder if what you're hearing in mine is is, is the the pentameter, the the the, um, uh, um, uh, the dam I am, as Ezra Pound <laughs> called it. Um, um, I, 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 I do naturally find myself falling, well not falling, but work naturally swimming in in in, in uh, five stresses a line. Um, more or less, um, more or less uh, evenly. I mean, the, the iab goes didum like a heartbeat, and an iab in pentameter line is five of them. And I, I do think I, I'm, I'm instinctively happiest in a in a in a version of that, which might be tighter or looser. So I think maybe that's what you were hearing in mine. Sorry, I, I don't sense that you're terribly postmodern. So sorry for that label, modern. Um, <laughs> What about that, though? What about the cadence and what you hope to achieve with the cadence? I mean, because you're both doing it. <laughs> you know, so I'm wondering, you know, and, and it, I guess for, I sense the different sort of cadence, but I'm just wondering if you could say something about that. Well, but I, could I, and I'll, I'll chip in in a way. Um, that is the, 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 the Larkin point, and it's interesting that we come to Larkin so often. Um, poems are always wiser and wider than the poets, just as the poets are always wiser and wider than the critics. I mean, we need, you know, we need all of those things. So that Larkin will say things like that, and yet when he's asked to choose his favorite poem, he chooses absences, and he says that, uh, he quotes the last line, such attics cleared of me, such absences. And he says it sounds like a faintly unconvincing translation of a French symbolist poem. I wish I could write like that more often. <laughs> now, it's, it's a wonderful thing to say, faintly unconvincing translation of a French poem, and so I wish I could write like that more often. So the, the, there's always some contrary pull, I take it, that in the very moments at which you will be Wordsworthian, you'll be aware of the dangers of being Wordsworthian. Right. I mean, Wordsworth right. isn't Wordsworthian except when he's not writing at his best. Yes. Yes. As Tennyson is not Tennysonian when he's writing at his best. So I would have thought there would be similar, there might be similar questions for you that the modern side of it has to do with the internal combustion engine. That is, Eliot thinks that modernism is acknowledging how much of the sensory rhythms in your body and in your poems now derives from the internal combustion engine, like a taxi throbbing waiting. And that's a rhythm which for him has a terrific lot to do with that unlovely pulse in throbbing 
waiting and so on. Going now, back to technology. I'm, I've answered on your behalf. Now you can answer on your own behalf. No, I just... Um, uh, he's done it. But um, I once had a student, when I, when I first started teaching, um, I was teaching at Kenyon College, and I had this uh, uh, young man who was doing his senior thesis with me, um, in a creative thesis um, in poetry. And he was a very free spirit, um, is a wonderful young man. Um, and the semester before, he had taken a workshop in which he was required to write an iambic pentameter and write sonnets and so on, and he couldn't do it. And uh, he got a D in the course. And I thought it was a bit sad because I, I thought he had some, he had facility with language, he had a good ear, he was a good poet, and I wanted to give him a chance. And so I said, I'll take you on, let's do it, and, and um, write your poems and I'll supervise you. And he was writing in about, about November. I can't remember whether he noticed it or I noticed it. It might actually have been him. But he said, it's so weird. I seem to be writing an iambic pentameter. And I said, um, what other courses are you taking, JT? And he said, uh, well, I'm taking astronomy, and I'm taking this, and I'm taking that, and I'm taking a course on Milton. <laughs> and I, I think ju just by the fact of reading Milton and being immersed in it without even thinking um, self-consciously about trying to write an iambic pentameter. It just went into him bodily, to get back to the Christopher's point about the body. Um, and I think that's maybe why in a sort of circuitous, circuitous way I was talking about my reading, because I think that it's one, one absorbs these cadences unconsciously um, some, to some degree, and then obviously in editing one messes with it. In editing, I try and uh, fix them, I suppose. It won't all be unconscious, but I mean, there are, there are real problems about the very vocabulary. I mean, Marsha Karp knows that my blood boils when I hear the expression, I be pentameter, since they scarcely ever exist. Marsha was one of the poets who read for me in Oxford. Uh, you can read 200 lines of Milton consecutively and not find a single I be pentameter. I, I, I quite agree. It's just a kind of average. It's like a platonic form. Well, you, yeah. you, what you have is the English heroic line. That was a very good term, iambic pentameter came at a certain moment, Shakespeare never talks about iambic pentameter, but nobody talks about iambic pentameter until very, very late in the day. They all said the English heroic line. Siegfried Sassoon has a poem which ends with the line, enough, 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 we have four minutes to go. Now that, uh, that is an iambic pentameter, and no doubt uh, O'Hara could write Detroit, 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 but you can go through the whole of King Lear and rack your brains to try and find a single iambic pentameter. In fact, let's all take a vow. Whenever we say iambic pentameter, we will give money to a charity. Uh, I suggest the Geoffrey Hill professorship in, in exactitude of wording to be, established, to be established here at BU. We have time for one more question. I feel like somebody on a TV show. One more question, please. Um, I would like to go back a bit to, towards the beginning of the conversation about uh, what was the Greek word you used again, Kieran, the platonic word? It was anamnesis. Anamnesis. I'm curious about that idea. I think that resonates in both your poetry, especially you, Saskia, with the, um, the image of the bird that calls and hearing the call before you even see the bird and that kind of sense of having that like, taste in your mouth. It, it's almost like a philosophical deja vu or something where you have that like, presence. And I guess that goes back to sort of the idea of place and the placement you being in the Netherlands and feeling like you've been there or there is some sort of history there. I'd just like to elaborate, for you to both to elaborate on that idea a little more. I love what you were saying, Kieran, about to unforget. That's yes. fabulous. Oh, um, well, it's, well, it's Plato, really, but uh, I, I, I just have a, I think, I think we're very um, Whiggish in our, uh, in our um, perhaps that's an English term, but it means, you, you know, Whiggishness. Do you know what that means? It means, to, it means a sort of, the, this kind of, idea that you get a lot of from modern politicians that if you're not working 16 hour days um, and, 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 and virtually you know popping with stress then, then you're not achieving anything and I, I'm, I'm just absolutely a, I'm, I'm regularly astonished by, by, by how much um, takes care of itself if you let it you know, if, uh, if you sink into yourself I think I think there's a time to chop and then we chop onions and carrots and there's a time to let it simmer. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I, I think we're terribly out of touch with silence and stillness um, in which we recalibrate to it in, in a way which isn't really cerebral. 
it's much more physiological. Yeah. A, a final word from both of you, and then I'll have an even more final word. Well, just quickly to, let, I'll let my final word be a reply, which is um, Marcia Karp, who's also who's there in the back, um, and I and several other poets were asked to translate Anglo-Saxon riddles. Um, and one of the um, wonderful things, interesting things that the scholars um, 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 before, bef and, 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 and translators before us um, have articulated about the mystery of some of those Anglo-Saxon riddles is um, if Adam was given the power to name all the animals, what would it be if they could all speak to us before they had their names? Um, and I think, that, that, I think that, that's what your question anyway reminded me of. Well, I'd very much like to ask you, Saskia, what, what, um, what some of the um, uh, uh, options that people have suggested for the meaning of that Anglo-Saxon really translated were, uh, or, uh, and what was going through your head? Um, it was a tough one. Uh, uh, as, as you, I mean, what, what, what It was the last to you? one on the list that hadn't been claimed, I think. Um, <laughs> and I thought, oh, good, this is a good one. Yeah, no, but, no, but the one, the reading I was most convinced by, and I read around, was Prophetic Dream. There are other possibilities, death, time, daylight, clouds. Daylight. Yeah. But prophetic dream was the one I was most convinced by. Yes. But it was, it was hard, actually, to translate it without knowing what it was. Yes. Well, the imagination may be compared to Adam's dream. He awoke and found it truth. That's what Keats says. Uh, Eliot, you remember, the words sufficed to compel the recognition they preceded. It's very exact and very mysterious. Um, well, I think our poets have shown the way in which words uh, can compel the recognition they precede. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs>